At Adamathy Digital, we strive to make archival humanities research accessible around the world for scholars of all experience levels. Our collections are designed not only to offer an organized array of important primary sources, but also to position these sources within their broader historical contexts. Today, we'll be taking a closer look at some of the many contextual tools that have been built into our collections with research and teaching in mind. We'll cover the contents of our introductory pages, essays and video interviews, virtual exhibitions and other visual features, and lastly, an interview with Rosie Perry, editor and production lead of Medical Services and Warfare, about how we conceptualize and design our contextual tools. The Introduction tab is a helpful place to start for any research session. Here, you'll find preliminary texts written by our editorial team, which introduce our primary source content, source archives, descriptions of file classes as needed, and the key topics or themes represented. This introductory text for Food and Drink and History explains that the primary sources contained in this collection relate to the global evolution of food in daily life in the public sphere, including the political, racial, gendered, and socioeconomic implications of food production and consumption. The text also indicates the various types of primary sources that users can expect to find, including printed and manuscript cookbooks, advertising ephemera, government reports, films, and illustrations. The introductory tab of this collection serves as a jumping off point for deep dives into thousands of primary sources. A key purpose for our contextual tools is to provide multiple pathways to documents and subcollections. The Explore and Research Tools tabs direct users to case studies, thematic guides, video lectures, and other audiovisual content. These tabs are also where users will find secondary essays written by members of our editorial boards. While developing new projects, our editorial and outreach teams consult with experts in their fields to determine the nature and scope of each collection. The essays connect context with content directly by incorporating links to relevant sources throughout. For one of our most recent publications, Module 1 of the Mass Observation Project, our editorial consultants recorded video essays which were transcribed and accompanied by a list of each of the documents referenced. In this video essay about the UK government's AIDS awareness campaign of 1987, Matt Cook from the University of London references 19 responses from mass observers who were prompted to comment on the reactions and opinions of the campaign as they experienced it. The summary tab of this video also allows users to navigate the observer's directive questionnaire and over 600 responses on this subject. Lists of key topics next to each video essay connect multiple subject areas, effectively broadening the scope of one's research. Several of our more visual collections feature virtual exhibitions of primary sources accompanied by a curatorial text. Much like physical museums and gallery spaces, these virtual exhibitions link objects thematically for further consideration and study. This exhibition from Victorian popular culture highlights optical entertainments of the 19th century, ranging from fine art to books, toys, and musical inventions. In this segment on illusions and shadows, users can click through a series of metamorphic images which showcase many aesthetic developments of the day. Our collections often feature interactive, subject-specific tools which can provide valuable context in the classroom setting, such as in-depth data visualizations and virtual tours. Migration to New Worlds offers several of these interactive features seen here. This migration map allows users to observe immigration trends in North America and Oceania over time. The Tenement Museum Apartments feature provides an interactive online tour of two family apartments in New York City. Users can explore panoramic views of each home and observe high-resolution images of the objects inside. These sources and their corresponding family biographies shed light on immigrant experiences of the 19th and early 20th centuries and expand users' understanding of the thousands of primary sources contained in this collection. We spoke with Rosie Perry, 
an editor and production lead for the Medical Services and Warfare Collection, to ask a few questions about how our contextual tools are designed and developed in conjunction with the primary source content that we publish. Medical Services and Warfare brings together thousands of documents, ranging from clinical notes to government records, journals, photographs, and more, to illustrate a century of medical advancements developed in connection with armed conflict. It starts with um, feedback from the development editor, who will have had uh, many conversations with the source archives and with the editorial board about which documents and which collections they think are going to be key to researchers in this area. And then we think about it as an editorial team from the perspective of how can we add value to these sources for researchers by providing um, an accessible and inspiring way into the primary source material. So we want to maximize discoverability and highlight key collections and themes, essentially. We think about the tools from the perspective of an undergraduate researcher quite often, because those are the people who may not have used these sources before, um, and they're looking for a way into the collection. That was born out of the fact that obviously the Alexander Fleming papers from the British Library are very um, key documents and they were kind of pivotal documents in the development of the second module. And the discovery of penicillin really is the, the kicking off point for the second module of medical services. So it starts in 1928, um, which is the date that Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. We already had the feature in module one that was built around the Florence Nightingale papers. And there are a lot of similarities in terms of the data for the Florence Nightingale papers and the Alexander Fleming feature. So, for example, I mean, the obvious similarity is that they're both from the British Library, um, both core collections. But then the kind of a less obvious similarity is the fact that they're quite large documents in the way that they're stored in the library and the way that they were digitized and sent to us. But through our indexing process, we were breaking them down into smaller sections. So for the Nightingale feature, they broke that down during the indexing um, phase of the project so that each individual letter could be accessed individually and you could see the correspondent of who'd written the letter and who they were writing um, who it was to and who it was from essentially and you could view them at that level of metadata and we were really doing a very similar thing with the Alexander Fleming notebooks so in the way that they were digitized and sent to us there were um, just a like double digit number of, of notebooks I think around 37 whereas in the database you'll notice that there are hundreds of lines of data um, and that's really broken down into his kind of sections of work so he would be you know conducting an experiment and that would be one line of metadata as opposed to the entire notebook so we wanted users to be able to access um, those sessions of his work individually rather than having to just access an entire notebook because that meant that you could then sort those chronologically because he didn't always work through his notebooks chronologically um, and it also meant that we could assign other metadata to those sections as well. So, for example, the kind of key topics that he was um, working on for each session, which allowed us to have the data for the Petri dish. Um, the idea of the Petri dish as a concept kind of was born out of the fact that we wanted the two features to complement each other. And um, for the Florence Nightingale feature, we had the lovely coxcomb uh, diagram, which was a form of data visualization that Florence Nightingale herself used in her letters. So that was a very obvious uh, form of data visualization to use for that feature. Whereas for the Fleming um, feature, we needed to think of something more appropriate. It didn't seem so appropriate to use the Coxcomb chart for the Alexander Fleming papers. And so as a team, really, um, whilst we were indexing the material and quality checking the digital images, we were thinking about how we might like to display the material from the Alexander Fleming papers. And we were thinking about all the different types of data visualizations that there are out there. 
and you know a very common one to use is the bubble chart so we just bought a bubble chart showing um the data from the alexander blending notebooks would look great as a petri dish it's a fun way and relevant way of showing his material uh, and his work Florence Nightingale and the Alexander Fleming papers are really just about utilising the metadata from the source archive and built upon by the editorial team. We decided that the best way to do that would be through data visualisation tools. Um, and then those tools allow users to spot trends and patterns in the data that wouldn't be so obvious when viewed in the traditional format. So that kind of, um, those, that was the thinking behind those. And then the other tool that I kind of wanted to talk about because it's so different to the to the Fleming and the Nightingale databases. So I particularly like the exhibition page that we've built around our video interview with uh, the Guinea Pig Club Secretary Bob Marchant. First hand account of working with the surgeon Archibald McKindo, I think really brings the related primary source content to life. So then when you're reading through that primary source content about the hospital, about the people who were working there, about the patients there, having Bob's perspective on it. And as somebody who's still so close to the guinea pig club today, I think it just adds a layer of perspective that you wouldn't have viewing those primary sources in isolation. To learn more about the collections featured in this video, please visit us on the web at amdigital.co.uk.